It's mid-April. It's mid-lockdown. And uh, I wonder whether you're getting as tired of being stuck at home as millions of others. Now, if I was to say Brexit, you might say to me, ah, but that's all done. It's all over. Uh, Boris Johnson won a thumping great big majority. And at 11 o'clock on the 31st of January, there were 100,000 people there in Parliament Square. Big celebration. And we're out. We're free. Isn't it wonderful? Well, sort of. Um, what happened on the 31st of January was a very major historic moment. But the devil is in the detail. And we are still part of the single market, part of the customs union. We don't have to negotiate you know, what our trade deal is or is not. Uh, and here's the key to this. And yeah, I know, I know, coronavirus, this crisis seems way, way more important because we're concerned about our friends, our families, our loved ones, ourselves even. Uh, economically, there is a huge amount of angst out there in the country and, you know, maybe the prospect of a million small businesses packing up within the next few weeks. So I know in some ways Brexit is not at the top of your minds, but let me just tell you over the course of the next few minutes why it needs to be. Now, I am still leader of the Brexit party. Yes, that's right. It still exists. And I'll tell you why it exists. Because in the past, we have had conservative governments making a whole series of promises to us and then letting us down like a cheap pair of braces. I mean, how many times did Mrs. May say Brexit means Brexit? And there is now enormous pressure coming upon the UK government for us not to be cleanly out of all of the institutions by the end of this year. Indeed, overnight, we have the boss of the IMF in Washington saying that, uh, you know, there needs to be an extension. Uh, this would be further disruption at this time. I mean, what the hell it's got to do with them? I've no idea. Um, but then again, they've you know effectively become a branch officer of the European Commission over the course of the last few years. So I want to talk today about why Brexit matters economically, and perhaps in some ways matters more right now than it's meant at any point. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by two of my former colleagues from the European Parliament, both Brexit Party MEPs, both businessmen. Yes, you heard it, people that have actually done a job before coming into politics. I know that doesn't really exist much in the Labour and Conservative parties, but it certainly does with us. And I want to talk, to begin with, what's the big picture within the Eurozone in particular, and then to find out what could our liabilities be if we're not cleanly out of this and it all starts to go horribly wrong, which it may well. So I'm going to begin by talking to Ben Habib. Uh, ben, I've read some of your articles. Um, I've read one today on The Telegraph online. You, know, you are talking about the big picture, the big picture of the Eurozone, um, and in particular, Italy and the problems that it's having. Ben, welcome uh, to this um, to this car, to, to this broadcast, Ben. Right. Tell me what tell me what your fears are for the eurozone. Well, my fears for the eurozone now are really a magnification of what my fears have always been, and it boils down to this, Nigel. The truth of the matter is that the ECB is not a central bank in the sense that it doesn't act as a mechanism by which member states can ensure that there's zero risk of them defaulting on their debt. If you look at the Bank of England, for example, together with the, with, with the government of the United Kingdom, there is no way that we can default on our gilts because we would simply print enough money to ensure that we honour our promises. But that doesn't, that's not the case in the, in, in the Eurozone. The ECB can't do that. And so what, what that means practically now is that whilst Italy, Greece, Spain and Portugal have to do a lot of stimulus to buoy their economies to get through this economic lockdown that's been caused by the coronavirus, they can't rely on the ECB to bail them out. And in effect, their debt levels are going to go from very high levels. I, I think Italy is at about 135% government debt to GDP ratio. Um, Greece is at 180%. Spain is similarly well over 100. And in fact, France as well, Nigel, is in the crosshairs of this problem with a debt to GDP ratio of 100%. And as these debt levels rise, 
they can't count on the ECB's support to bail them out, which means that you're going to have a massive economic catastrophe in, in the Eurozone. Just to make it clear to people, we're talking about the European Central Bank based in Frankfurt. And what you're saying is it is not an ultimate guarantor. It isn't. It can't act in the same way that the Bank of England can act for the British government or the Federal Reserve can act for the US government or indeed the Bank of Japan um, can act for the Japanese government. And Japan, Japan is worth having a quick look at. You know, it's got a debt to GDP ratio of 240 percent, which is absolutely whopping. But 70 percent of that is owned by the Bank of Japan. So it's Japan owing itself money. There is no risk there. There's no risk for anyone who owns Japanese government bonds because it knows that the Bank of Japan will bail them out. But there's huge risk in the ECB because it doesn't represent Italy. It doesn't represent Spain. It represents 19 member state countries, and it doesn't look after their interests in the same way that the Bank of Japan, Bank of England or Fed does for its countries. There's an alternative here, of course, and that would be that the countries in the north, and I'm talking about Germany, the Netherlands, countries like that, the countries in the north could, of course, just give lots of money to countries in the south that are struggling. They could. They could, and that is the stark choice that they've now got. But I'd be absolutely staggered if the German people or the Dutch people, who are prudent by nature, would underwrite what they see and have expressed uh, in the past as being the profligacy of the southern rim countries. You know, it would go against the grain completely in their own countries, and they would effectively be bailing out these countries at the cost of their own pop populace. You know, it's something that would be virtually impossible to conceive for any government in the north. So, in essence, in essence Ben, we've got Mediterranean countries. Um, Italy is the one to talk about, really, with a population of over 60 yeah. million that are perhaps in danger of literally going bust? Is that what we're saying? That is literally what we're talking about. It nearly happened to Greece in 2012, and we're going to have Greece multiplied by a magnitude of at least 10 when it comes okay. to Italy. Ben Habib, thank you for that. So that's Ben's analysis, and certainly there are massive, massive strains between the north and the south of Europe, and Ben making clear that the European Central Bank is not a central bank, as we understand central banks to be. But of course, we're not in the Eurozone. Thank goodness. Thank goodness we didn't listen to Ken Clark and Tony Blair and Michael Heseltine and all of them. We're not in the Eurozone. We're left the European Union. We've got a few bits of trade policy to sort out. Why does it... I mean, of course, we don't want to see terrible hardship in the Mediterranean. But why the hell should it matter to us? Well, to answer that very very important political question. I'm joined by city analyst and former Brexit party MEP, Jake Pugh. Jake, uh, tell us, nothing to do with us. We shouldn't worry, should we? Hello, Nigel. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's you've hit the nail on the head uh, as ever. So, so basically, as you said, Dor Boris said, we'll get Brexit done by the end of uh, January 2020. Then we'll enter the negotiation period. And then it's all done and we're out. But in fact, our exposure to the Eurozone, which you and Ben have just walked through, continues for another decade at least after the trade deal and Brexit is truly done. And that continues through our shareholding in the European Investment Bank. So the UK, as part of its accession when it joined the European community back in 73, it ponied up the best part of three and a half billion euros in 1973 as part of our membership. Um, and that bank's le lent a load of money. And effectively, we don't get our money back, that three and a half billion, for another 12 years. But worse than that, the profit that bank has made, which we're entitled to as one of the shareholders, we're leaving that behind. So that's seven billion quid of UK taxpayers' money. But the real problem is, is if the Eurozone, perhaps I should say when the Eurozone goes pop any time in the next few years, we're still on the hook for those loans because the guarantees for those loans come from the member states, Nigel, 
And the terms of that guarantee is something called joint and several. So effectively, one, one of the members goes bust, everybody's on the hook. And what does that mean in financial terms, potentially? Well, the size of the loan book, we, at, at any point in the next 12 years, we can be called for over 30 billion euros. That's called callable capital. So when we signed up to be a member of the EIB, we put up three and a half billion, but we said, we're in for another 30 at any time you call us. So any time in the next 12 years, the EIB can say, we need that money. So we're callable for 30 billion at any point under the terms of the withdrawal agreement. But then going beyond that, if any of the loans that the EIB have made, they go bust, then we're on the hook because the liability is joint and several. But I'm sure that our Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has got all this under control. Well, as, as, as you know, it's, it's a sort of... It's a sad story in a way, but it was actually the day of the Saturday sitting of Parliament. And if you remember, the, all the transport was up the spout. And I actually travelled in with Rishi on the tube. And he was introdu- I introduced myself to him. Very affable, very charming. And he sort of said, you know, how, what's it like being an MEP? So we had a bit of a chat. And he said, what, what, sort of, what, you know, what have you been working on? So I started talking about the exposure of the UK through the EIB and the seven billion of taxpayers' money were leaving behind. And of course, he was number two at the Treasury at the time. And he looked at me and he said, sorry, w- w- what's that about? So, you know, and, and I think, as, as you said, a couple of last, last week on your Facebook Live, Nigel, that, you know, that he's not necessarily going to know everything that's going on. But why aren't the Treasury officials, why aren't the civil servants making him aware of that sort of liability? Because they never wanted us to leave and they want us to extend, Jake. Well, that's the reason why I'm pretty clear about it. All right, well, listen, that's a very good summation uh, from both of you. So look, folks, we have still got work to do. If, 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 if the Brexit party hadn't been formed a year ago, we wouldn't even have left on the 31st of January. Our job now is to be like an insurance policy, like fire insurance on the house. Yes, I've heard some great words this week from David Frost, our chief negotiator, who's spoken to me, Barnier, who tells us we will not extend. And that that date, we have to give notice by the 1st of July if we're going to go into 2021. But remember, Mrs. May told us Brexit means Brexit. We're leaving on March the 29th. She told us 108 times we were leaving on March the 29th, 2019, and we didn't. So, look, what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to get a series of guests on of the same calibre that I've had today to talk about why getting a clean break from this European Union matters so much. Do you know what? They can have our seven billion sitting on the table at the EIB as long as we get out of any future liabilities. So, I'm going to keep this series going. I know we're in a big crisis. To quote Boris, and thank goodness he's better. We're in a national emergency. But actually, being free to make our own trade deals, to choose our own path in the world, after this crisis will probably be more important than it's ever been at any point in modern history. If you want to follow these developments, you want to be kept up to speed, then please share these videos, share this information with your friends, log on to the Brexit Party website, give us your email, and we'll make sure you find out every time we've got information to impart. Meanwhile, make the best of lockdown. Thank you.